Hi all. Um, very uh, good evening for all the attendees. Uh, welcome to our third uh, week of our webinar for this month. So this month we are all talking about uh, COVID-19 and this is the most important I feel this week where we will talk about uh, respiratory sequelae of uh, in in COVID-19. That's most important for for this COVID-19. And for that, uh, we have the two esteemed um, speaker and chairperson. And uh, I'd like to welcome Dr. Jamalud as a chairperson and also Dr. Kumarish um, as a speaker. I'd like to introduce Dr. Jamalud. He's a consultant a pulmonologist from Sedang Hospital. And he received undergrad uh, degree from Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland in 1989. And he obtained a master in of uh, internal medicine at year 1997 from UKM and uh, com uh, subsequently completed his fellowship in pulmonology in uh, 2003. And uh, he currently is a chair chairman of Malaysian uh, Bronchosco Bronchoscopy and Interventional Pulmonology Society. And um, we like very privileged to have both uh, Dr. Jamal and Dr. Kumarish for this week. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Jamalu. Thanks. Thank you uh, very much, Dr. Jeevan, for the kind introduction. Um, so um, I would like to welcome uh, all, uh, all of you. Sure, some of you are my friends, colleagues, and, and uh, junior uh, specialists, uh, medical officers. Um, welcome to this uh, weekly uh, webinar and for the whole of uh, October, uh, the man the man has been dedicated to uh, COVID nineteen, and uh, we know that um, uh, overall COVID nineteen is getting better in Malaysia. And hope uh, that the improvement will uh, continue. And um, over the last couple of weeks, we've you know uh, we've heard about uh, updates in the management of COVID nineteen, and then the role of ultrasound in COVID-19. So um, uh, for today, um, we're going to hear about post-COVID-19 sequelae, uh, focusing specifically on the lung complications, how you diagnose and manage the lung complications of uh, post-COVID-19 uh, infection. And um, uh, there are very few uh, uh, experts uh, who are, uh, you know, uh, uh, qualified to speak on this uh, topic, um, uh, you know, and one of them uh, is Dr. Kumarish Raj Lachmanan, um, consultant pulmonologist extraordinaire from Hospital Raja Promissory Bainun, IPO, and um, Dr. Uh, Kumarish uh, uh, was one of my trainees uh, in Sardang, and um, he did, uh, um, uh, you know. Uh, Intensive training uh, in pulmonology. Uh, he was in Perth, um, uh, Aust Western Australia, just like me. Uh, you know, uh, for training in pulmonary physiology, sleep medicine, and um, so. Um, um, and uh, anyone who has got any uh, anything to ask, please uh, use the chat box, uh, the Q and A box uh, at the bottom there. Uh, and then uh, we will try to uh, reply to your questions. And so uh, without further ado, um, uh, Dr. Kumaresh, uh, the virtual floor is yours now. Thank you, Dr. Jamalul, for the kind introduction and thanks to AM for the invitation again. So I think in the early days of the pandemic, we struggled with a lot of uncertainties about acute management of COVID-19. We have come a long way since then, thanks to a lot of <clears throat> collaborative clinical trials worldwide. Now, acute care of COVID-19, well, uh, I think uh, it's fa fairly manageable by uh, not only the ID folks, but a lot of people. And because the acute care of COVID-19 has improved so much, uh, now we... Uh, inundated with the post-COVID-19 care. And the uh, lung sequelae in uh, post-COVID-19 is um, one of the, com it is the commonest uh, sequelae that we have to deal with. 
So uh, to be honest, uh, this is evolving. Uh, we are still finding out and learning about new things on a regular basis. Uh, some of you may be too young to know Johnny Nash was uh, best uh, hit was, uh, I can see clearly now, but it's not the case with uh, post-COVID-19 lung sequelae. His other album uh, describes it more apt. There are more questions than answers. So um, uh, I will let you know what is known and uh, what is uh, not known as we go on. So this is my outline of my talk. Uh, I'll be basically focusing on two post-COVID-19 post lung sequelae, which are uh, organizing pneumonia, which is in, on everybody's mouth these days, and also post-COVID-19 pulmonary fibrosis. So uh, the COVID pandemic is still raging on. Uh, first uh, identified in December 2019, and within three months, it was declared a pandemic by WHO. Uh, since then, multiple variants have emerged and sustained the pandemic. Uh, the, uh, it being an upper respiratory tract infection and subsequently a lower respiratory tract infection, it is uh, inevitable that lung uh, represents the commonest organ involved both during the acute phase and also the post-COVID-19 uh, phase. So uh, medium to long-term complications are going to uh, inevitably invokes the pulmonologist to be involved, uh, but uh, I think that's just not enough of us to deal with all, all, uh, all these complications and we really need help from general medicine as well. So the, uh, the, the, the structure of the SARS-CoV-2 is, is public knowledge, basically everybody has heard about the spike protein and uh, in all its glory, the spike protein and the ACE2 receptor. Basically, the spike protein locks to the ACE2 receptor. ACE2 receptor is quite ubiquitous in the human body, but highly concentrated in both the upper respiratory tract and the lower respiratory tract, namely the alveolar epithelial cells. It locks, and then courtesy of a serine, a transmembrane protein series, it tends to the cleavage allows the virus to proceed with membrane fusion and get into the cell. And once it gets inside the cells, it takes over trans translational machinery for uncontrolled uh, replication. So thankfully, uh, unlike the uh, first SARS-CoV, uh, the first SARS-CoV and the MERS, uh, majority are asymptomatic, only 5% become ill. Risk factors have been uh, identified, uh, but uh, some, some patients who don't have these traditional risk factors also get severe COVID. So we believe uh, host level genetic factors uh, related to immunology also likely exist. So uh, basically the uh, building on from my previous slide, once the virus gets inside, it invokes both the innate and the adaptive immune uh, system, and then goes into an inflammatory cascade and leads to respiratory failure. There's a lot of things that actually happen uh, at a cellular level uh, in SARS-CoV-2 infection, but uh, uh, which, which makes it very difficult to understand. One of my favorite uh, articles is this by Domingo, which actually teases it out or dif uh, divides it into four different vicious loops that uh, cause harm to the uh, lung. The first is the viral loop. Basically, SARS-CoV-2 is a very sneaky virus. It can evade the traditional interferon response and uh, lead to pathogen and damage associated molecular patterns uh, stimulation. And it can go on to replicate uncontrolled in a cell. And when that happens, uh, uh, biologically, when, 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 when a virus actually replicates intracellularly, the cell actually, uh, uh, due to uh, the chromatin machinery, tends to go into apoptosis. So that's one way to actually prevent uh, viral replication. So the cell tends to die. But there are two ways that this happens. One is a peaceful death apoptosis where nuclear fragmentation takes place and the cell peacefully goes off. But in... Um, in a, a SARS-CoV-2 cellular infection, what, uh, there is also another pathway of cellular death or programmed cellular death called pyroptosis. So what happens is uh, when you have pyroptosis, it's, it's like kamikaze. It's an inflammatory cell death that uh, when the cells die, they liberate a lot of chemokines, cytokines that leads to the hyperinflammatory loop. The other thing the SARS-CoV-2 does is uh, downregulate ACE2 receptors and 
that uh, results in increased uh, levels of angiotensin II. Uh, now the RAS axis loop is well known to our cardiology and nephrology clicks. Uh, they've used ACE inhibitors for many years, but uh, so, so increase in angiotensin II leads to sympathetic nervous system activation, blood pressure increase, vessel constriction, but uh, a less well-known uh, uh, effect of angiotensin II is actually pro-fibrotic and pro-inflammatory effects. So this, uh, what what uh, have, uh, so the RAS axis loop, which uh, which is a loop that maintains uh, the lung in a healthy state. That means the balance between pro-inflammatory inflammatory state is lost, and the lung becomes pro-inflammatory. The other thing is uh, the endothelial cells, the of the capillary endothelium, which is very proximate to the alveoli, also gets infected. There's ACE two receptors there. This leads to a highly uh, hypercoagulative part, uh, loop because of tissue factor and thrombin generation. There's also this other pathway that's become quite um, spoken about now, but uh, at best still remains controversial, which is netosis where the, 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 the chemoattractants that bring the neutrophils to the uh, alveolar capillary uh, complex which is, uh, uh, this is called neutrophil extracellular traps. This leads to platelet dysfunction and also thrombin generation. So all these things, all these four loops actually lead to uh, lung damage. So over time, we have come to understand the cause of, uh, the cause of uh, COVID-19, the asymptomatic, stage one, the non-severe symptomatic stage two, and uh, the severe respiratory inflammatory or the cytokine release syndrome stage three. Uh, basically, once it goes to this hyperinflammatory pathway is where uh, lung damage happens because of the highly inflammatory milieu. So it is actually very crucial to appreciate the lung response to injury. Because Understanding the pattern of lung response to injury actually consolidates or provides us a window to comprehend post-injury sequelae better, which brings me to my uh, next slide about patterns of lung injury response. So uh, talking about the patterns of lung injury response uh, reminded me by a famous quote by Carl Bernard, which is a 17th century uh, physiologist. He was not talking about the lung, but what he said actually uh, resonates with uh, uh, lung injury response. He said that physiological and pathological states are ruled by the same forces. And how that actually uh, applies uh, to lungs response to injury is because despite various agents of damage, whether, whether you have aspirated a chemical agent, whether you've got a viral infection or bacterial infection, the lung's response to injury is fairly limited. It's fairly limited. So using that background knowledge, we have uh, exploited uh, the limited response of lung to injury to try to understand our post-COVID lung sequelae. So fundamentally, organization uh, uh, is a universal response to lung injury. Basically, after there's damage, there's some form of organization. And uh, central to that is actually fibroblast uh, proliferation. What subsequently happens with this fibroblast proliferation, whether you actually go to an OP pathway, whether you go into a uh, alveolar pneumocyte hypoplasia or you get into a fixed fibrous tissue it depends basically on the integrity of epithelial and endothelial basement. It depends whether the injury is actually repetitive or not. Repetitive injury makes uh, uh, the repair self-reinforcing and can lead to fibrosis and other response patterns. But if the injury is only at one go, one time, there is a good chance you can escape uh, fibrosis. In most settings, organization clears as part of the repair process. But of course, this really depends on the severity of the injury and host level genetic factors. The patterns of injury response in, uh, uh, in lung uh, are this. It is uh, diffuse alveolar damage. When you get that, uh, after that, the organization phase of DAD, that's one of the patterns of injury response. The other one is organizing pneumonia. 
The third one is uh, AFOP, acute fibrinous alkalizing pneumonia, which is a histological virion. And the fourth one is fibrotic changes. Uh, a fifth one, which is eosinophilic pneumonia, has been described, but uh, it's, uh, and it's been made famous by uh, Weiping Iwali, but I won't be discussing that because it does, it does because that has not been described in uh, SARS-CoV-2. So basically, DAD and OP are non-specific reactions. They, as I said earlier, uh, regardless of the injurious agent, whether it's a viral infection, whether it's a chemical, or the, yeah, whether it's an autoimmune mechanism, this can be. Uh, these patterns tend to exist, so they're non-specific. Just because you have OP, it doesn't tell you it's because of viral infection. It can be a lot of things, connective tissue disease, and, and uh, etc. Uh, DAD and OP actually represents the bookends of uh, the spectrum of injury. DAD on one end and OP on one end. AFOP is probably about 30 years old. It's a histological variant and uh, clinical significance is uh, uns uncertain. It's a bit uncertain uh, uh, and uh, debatable, but it certainly exists as a histological variant has been well described. So uh, this uh, this time this timeline or this graph uh, 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 basically characterizes what happens. Uh, a viral lymphocytic pneumonia at the beginning as the viral phase tapers off, the inflammatory response of the host takes place. Acute lung damage happens, and upon recovery, the pattern of uh, lung injury response can be. Uh, read based on uh, radio, uh, radiographic interpretation can be of diffuse cellular damage or organizing pneumonia. And somewhere in between, you can at least uh, you can have AFOP. And over time, whether it actually ends up being fibrotic or not. Uh, so uh, even before seeing the CT scan, you can actually anticipate what the radiographic pattern is going to be. If, if the patient is very bad, stage 4B and beyond, most of the time it's going to be diffuse cellular damage. If the patient is uh, done well, recovered, didn't need intubation, most of the time the radiographic pattern is going to be that of organizing pneumonia. Uh, by organizing pneumonia, which are the two main uh, patterns of lung injury response in COVID. So first off uh, is DAD. So DAD is divided into two phases, the acute phase and organizing phase, but this is not uh, strictly biologically divisive. You can get overlapping of these phases. Uh, uh, the acute phase starts off with uh, alveolar wall edema and within 24 hours is followed by eye membranes uh, occupying the alveolar space. The alveolar pneumocyte hyperplasia can take place subsequently uh, any, any time. It can happen in, after day one, can happen after day four. Uh, there's individual variability in response and also uh, depending on the injury uh, whether you get repetitive injury, interstitial fibrosis or fibrosis-like changes can actually happen. Uh, it's important to note that just because you have DAD is not doom and gloom. Uh, you can actually return to normal depending on various factors. But uh, due to various agents of injury, the reported uh, recovery rate is quite variable. As you can see, they say 30 to 80 percent can have significant, significant fibrosis. What I need to emphasize is DAD is actually uh, strictly, uh, uh, traditionally, it's actually a histological variant. Uh, I, I know I showed uh, the graph earlier that actually showed DAD better radiographic, but uh, tried, uh, DAD is actually the histological equivalent of ARDS. So in clinical rounds, and me included, we tend to use this term DAD pattern and we see what looks like ARDS, but strictly speaking, DAD is a histological uh, pattern. And diffuse actually does not mean all over the lung. Diffuse alveolar damage actually means all the layers of the alveolar, that which is appreciated microscopically. So all the constitutions of the alveolar wall, the, 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 the type 1, type 2 pneumocyte, their basement membrane, the, the endothelial cell basement membrane, and also the capillary wall. That's diffuse alveolar damage histological. So it, it doesn't need to be widespread. You can have a very focal damage and histological that can be DAD. But you have a ARDS, what radiologically looks like ARDS, the histological uh, equivalent of that tends to be diffuse cellular damage.
So you can appreciate the alveolar wall here and here. And this is early interstitial fibrosis with collagen deposition. And this is highly membrane. Uh, and uh, as you can see, because of uh, type 2 pneumocyte damage, the alveolar wall has collapsed a bit because you don't have enough of surfactants. Uh, type 2 pneumocytes actually produce surfactants and lack of that leads to loss of alveolar volume. And you can see early organizing fibroblastic tissue, which is uh, quite, uh, which is a uh, universal response to this uh, DAD. So what's the story in COVID-19 patients? Uh, majority, nearly all of the reported histology is from autopsy. And, uh, and uh, so uh, that actually means you have pre-selected uh, the, the extremely ill or the most ill of patients to, uh, to look. So you cannot generalize uh, these findings to the, the milder patient. So what they found out in these extremely ill patients, they actually succumb. The histology tends to be diffuse alveolar damage and uh, acute fibrinous organizing pneumonia. I need to mention that AFOP, uh, when, when it occurs on its own, it, tends, it, it is highly steroid responsive. It tends to be steroid responsive and is considered a steroid responsive uh, interstitial lung uh, disease or, inter uh, or histological variant. But AFOP with a background of diffuse alveolar damage whether it's actually steroid responsive or not is uh, questionable. Uh, the current thinking that it isn't. And uh, the very fact that majority, a lot of these patients have been treated with steroids that, but still succumb actually suggests this, uh, this AFOP interspersed with diffuse alveolar damage does not tend to be a, a highly steroid responsive disease. And also I need to mention, uh, it would be criminal of me if I don't mention this thing, pulmonary vascular endothelitis, which has been uh, spoken about a lot. This, Specifically, this makes this uh, SARS-CoV-2, this COVID-19 thing, very unique and differentiates it from uh, influenza, the SARS-CoV-1, and the MERS-CoV uh, uh, autopsy findings. Uh, I dare say nearly all, if not all, of uh, the studies have shown a high degree of pulmonary vascular endothelitis in, uh, uh, in autopsy of uh, COVID-19 patients. So radiologically, how do they look like? Uh, usually, the, the, the DAD would look like an uh, ARDS uh, radiology. You can see crazy paving pattern here, sepal thickening against uh, a lot of GGOs, inter interlobular and intralobular changes. There's also, uh, uh, because there's so much inflammatory exudate, which tends to gravitate, you can get this uh, gravity, gravitational gradient or dependent consolidation. So there's been a tendency to probably over-report any consolidative findings in uh, COVID-19 CTs as OP, but uh, not all consolidations are OP, as uh, most of you would have learned, uh, heard about the prone, uh, prone technique in, uh, in uh, ARDS. So you can see here the inflammatory exudates uh, are actually gravitationally dependent. The other finding that uh, uh, about this uh, uh, so-called diffuse alveolar damage pattern or ARDS pattern is uh, uh, spat lobules with clear demarcation uh, or geographic findings, which you, you can actually see them. Uh, they very uh, geographic. A bit, uh, the interface between abnormal and normal uh, uh, normal lung tissue is very sharp. So this is, that's another feature that I commonly see. Uh, those of you who don't have routine access to CTs, uh, basically, if you have bilateral diffuse opacification of the lungs, consolidated changes in the airborne program, that, you, uh, that typically presents uh, uh, ARDS uh, appearance. So from DAD, I'll, I'll move on to OP now. Uh, just like DAD, as I alluded to earlier, OP is a non-specific lung injury response. Histologically, it's characterized by the presence of inflammatory cells and connective tissue metrics, uh, usually at the, uh, within the distal S spaces. The uh, alveolar cell death with disruption of basal lamina is, the, is thought to be the initiating event. So uh, the natural history of OP, if everything goes smoothly, there's no repetitive injury. The, 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 pri the first, the primary injury itself is remodeled by re and repair of the basement membrane. After that, 
resorption of uh, metrics can happen. So this, uh, this can happen spontaneously, but can be expedited by uh, steroids as well. So uh, those of you who have heard about OP related to other disease, cryptogenic or secondary autoimmune disease, uh, steroid is the primary uh, form of treatment. So uh, the, 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 the radiological appearance of OP is heterogeneous. Uh, none of it is 100% diagnostic or specific. It can be highly suggestive of OP, but uh, the, the, the differential di there, there are differential diagnoses for such appearance. So subpural and peribrocovascular consolidations are one of the typical findings of OP, the reverse atoll sign. Uh, basically, you, you see GGUs in the middle and uh, consolidative changes surrounding uh, these uh, ground glass opacities. Perilobular consolidations. Uh, uh, this is quite. Uh, this is considered highly uh, consistent with uh, OP, but I've seen patients having a, a mucinous adenosine, which is sort of appearance, so we have to be careful. The subpleural curvy linear band, which uh, is one of the uh, one of the radiological changes that can be consistent with uh, OP. It can also be just it can also just mean fibroatelectatic uh, changes. Multiple nodules, migratory nodules, consolidated changes are uh, possible. It's also not impossible to have large area of focal consolidation, but although this uh, has a very broad differential type cis OP can look like that, but this is not. The OP that we see, we typically see in COVID-19 infections. Uh, so traditionally, OP requires histology for diagnosis, although it's been said that uh, experts in interstitial lung disease are allowed to make the diagnosis just based on radiology in the right setting. But uh, uh, strictly speaking, OP should be uh, should uh, should get histology for diagnosis. But uh, I think uh, this is just not possible during the pandemic for every case. Uh, so hence, it's actually best resolved in the MDD setting, which is the gold standard for an ILD diagnosis. MDD is multidisciplinary discussion. So just made up uh, this lovely article by Andrew Nicholson. Uh, basically, old patterns in new clothing is what I was telling you about. There's just a limited number of lung, resp uh, uh, lung response for injury. So everything that happens in COVID, then you can actually have your DAD organizing your pneumonia-pyrotic phase. But of course, it does not have to, it, this is not cast in stone. It doesn't have to religiously follow this. It, this is influenced by time point of uh, disease evolution, severity of the disease, individual level genetic factors, and also the pathways that are stimulated by the viral infection. All right, so now I'll move on to uh, the first of the lung sequelae that I want to talk about, which is post-COVID-19 OP. Uh, there should be no surprise that OP happens in COVID-19 infection. As I've said, it's just one of the known uh, lung injury response pattern. Uh, however, many questions to date remain unanswered. Uh, that's because we have zero RCTs. We have plethora of uh, case reports, but uh, zero RCT, uh, uh, but none of them are actually controlled against a placebo group. Uh, you, uh, uh, from what I've gathered, speaking to people, clinical practice and disease process interpretation in uh, in uh, in Malaysia itself has enormous variability. Different uh, chest physicians have different idea about uh, this or, or about this uh, entity. So uh, I thought I'd tackle uh, this topic by just trying to answer two uh, two questions that are frequently spoken about uh, this post COVID OP. First one is basically when is it actually post COVID OP, and what is the steroid regimen for post-COVID OP? So logically, it should be after the injury has been inflicted uh, because that is the trajectory of uh, injury response. COVID-19 itself is very tricky. It has a pneumonia pattern similar to OP appearance. In the previous epidemics, the, 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 the first SARS-CoV, the, the MERS-CoV, OP has been described, but not as much. Probably one reason is because it didn't really hit the pandemic scale such as COVID-19. The other thing is 
there's, there's just something about COVID-19 in which the pneumonic phase itself has a pattern so similar to that of OP pattern that uh, even uh, uh, RSNA actually included in its criteria for typical appearance, what they call uh, changes of OP-like changes. But uh, to just use an OP pattern diagnosis for OP will likely lead to overdiagnosis inevitably. This is the RSNA criteria. You can see among the typical appearances of other findings of organizing pneumonia. So the, the, the COVID pneumonia during its pneumonic phase itself has a lot, the changes is uh, it, 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 it inevitably invokes uh, 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 the, the thought that, uh, that it appears as per OP as we have known it before COVID-19. So actually, for a very long time, even in the early pandemic, I was actually grappling with this concept that is SARS-CoV inevitably induces OP. There was an article by Jeffrey Kane that actually said that uh, uh, there's been widespread failure to actually identify SARS-CoV-2 induced OP pattern. But I always, I always was wondering uh, whether it's actually really OP or not. So, uh, but. No, you would think that no one is going to be daring enough to actually do a histology during acute uh, COVID infection. I thought so as well, but uh, not, not the Italian group uh, led by uh, Venerino Poletti. Uh, for those of you not in the know, uh, Poletti is uh, one of the world's leading experts in transbronchial cryobiopsy. So basically, this is uh, putting a catheter into the lung guided by CT scan and fluoroscopy and taking a uh, cool, cooling it to sub-zero and taking the sample for histology. Uh, uh, Dr. Jamalu is actually our national and regional expert in this transbronchial lung cryobiopsy. I'm not sure whether he agrees with me or not, but I, I thought this was a bit daring and bordering on a bit of insanity to actually do this study, but I'm very grateful they actually did this study because I've always been curious uh, what how it looked like uh, in the uh, what was the histology in the acute phase. So what they did was actually do this TBLC, the, the, the basically lung biopsy, these 12 uh, COVID-19 patients uh, within 20 days of symptom onset. So this is very much in the... Uh, acute phase, early post-acute phase. And if you notice, all the radiographic findings of HRCT are very lobular pattern, very lobular pattern. Uh, all these things are, uh, are what are descri typically described uh, or what RSNA recommended to consider as an OP, OP-like pattern. So in the, in the histology that they reported, uh, actually uh, none of it uh, had uh, OP on histology. The main finding they found is uh, alveolar epithelial cell type two hyperplasia. So this is uh, 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 this is sort of uh, recovery or response to injury. Uh, there was no evidence of hyaline membrane. So uh, this is in contrast to the severe group. The severe group, virtually everyone had hyaline membranes consistent with diffuse cellular damage. But this is this is not the severe group. Uh, this is not the severe group. So you'd expect the histology to be different. Uh, it did not. They 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 they, they said that it did not matter match the typical features of diffuse cellular damage observed in post-mortem studies. That's very much because there was absence of uh, hyaline membranes uh, and match the previously two reported anti-mortem reports. So this, uh, there were two actually two case reports where uh, I didn't go through them, but what I know is, is basically lung cancer cases where they found out the patient was actually infected with COVID later. So when they actually took out the cancer, they also found, saw some histology which matched the histology de described by Poletti's team, as uh, mentioned above. Uh, there was also increased capillarization of the L receptor. So this may be something what people call the L phenotype, where you can get all this uh, vascular vasoplegia. So they also noted that finding. So actually, what what uh, what uh, sometimes this these things are actually reported as OP pattern, but that's not wrong because it actually looks like OP pattern. Uh, but actually, histologically, actually, it is not the uh, OP. So obviously, most studies like that is needed. It'd be good if somebody can replicate uh, uh, 
Dr. Poletti's study. But this certainly highlights the need to differentiate the OP pattern, OP histology. Uh, tradition, uh, I, I, basically, we know what people mean by when OP pattern, but strictly speaking, there is only a UIT pattern that is well defined in uh, interstitial lung disease. There is, there is, there is uh, Tech, uh, every, there is technically no such thing as NSIT pattern and OP pattern, but there are, although there are findings which are highly typical of such patterns. But don't get me wrong, uh, steroids actually work in uh, COVID pneumonia. Nevertheless, uh, the recovery study, which is which will go down in history as one of the important studies in our lifetime, because uh, this was the study that actually showed that has gone in contrast to other uh, uh, viral uh, viral pneumonias, the uh, steroids actually work. So then that set forth the, uh, uh, the anti-inflammatory pathway, paracetinib and all those drugs to be good. So some people speculate that uh, one reason why DEXA actually works in uh, uh, steroids actually works in COVID-19 pneumonia is because it actually prevents the occurrence of uh, organizing pneumonia. That, that of course is uh, speculative. But, but uh, don't get me wrong, uh, OP post uh, COVID 19 pneumonia certainly exists, but uh, not every case that appears to have the OP pattern will be OP on histology. So, uh, one of the studies that has attracted a lot of uh, attention is uh, actually this study by the UK group. Uh, it's an observational study. Uh, of persistent post COVID 19 interstitial lung disease. Uh, this UK team, what they did by phone assessment four weeks after discharge uh, for 837 patients, 39% had, had symptoms. So those who had ongoing symptoms, they actually saw them, uh, uh, ongoing pulmonary symptoms, they actually saw them in outpatient setting at six weeks. The, uh, the, in an MDT setting, uh, they actually taught uh, about 4.8% of this uh, group of patients radiologically, they had what looked like organizing pneumonia. This, there, was no, uh, there was no histological proof. Uh, that they didn't mention why, but there could be a, a lot of practical reasons to that. But in, uh, in MDT setting where there are a lot of experts, they concluded that it had an OP-like pattern and they actually, uh, 30 out of the 35 of patients went on to receive steroid treatment. The other five did not for various reasons uh, such as uh, reducing treatment or had contraindications to steroids. And the treated group actually had significant functional symptoms and functional as symptoms in pulmonary uh, physiology indices. They had radiological improvement, most of it described as near complete uh, resolution and also clinical symptomatic uh, improvement. They used a very modest dose of steroid, 0.5 milligram per kilogram, and tapered it over three weeks. This is, of course, uh, very different from the steroid regimens that we use for autoimmune uh, OP or cryptogenic OP, which can go up to 6 to 12 months. The reason why you think three weeks will work is because the, the, the stimulus for the uh, uh, lung injury response is no longer there because the virus is all dead and no longer infecting the, the epithelial cells. So uh, nevertheless, I think all of us uh, tend to administer steroids uh, despite the paucity of evidence. Uh, this study actually provides some reassurance uh, that, that there is certainly, even though there is no, uh, even though there is, uh, we don't have histological proof that is OP, but uh, uh, this, uh, this proves that, uh, that there is at least a post-COVID-19 inflammatory ILD that has an OP-like pattern that actually responds to steroids. Of course, we need more studies uh, to identify and tease out this group. It has to be borne in mind that the study described an observational cohort without a placebo group. There is no placebo group in this observational study. So uh, the big query is whether these patients would have gone on to spontaneously recover on their own. Uh, that, that is, of course, a, a huge uh, question. Uh, but when, uh, uh, by this study, gave a hint that steroids can actually accelerate resolution. 
at least in this uh, opioid pattern radiologically, the two questions that remain are uh, do these patients with persistent inflammatory or at least post COVID become fibrotic and does steroid prevent them? If uh, steroid does, does, does not prevent them, whether there is an opportunity to let them heal on their own, especially patients who could, who could have a lot of adverse effects to corticosteroids. And also, uh, uh, God, uh, Oh, what I wanted to say. Yeah, it's also the other thing is this uh, this English group, uh, although they mentioned opioid pattern in decided in the MDT, in the title, they actually use this term persistent inflammatory ILD. I, I think I've become a fan of this. I, I pre, short of histology, I like to use this term persistent inflammatory ILD. There's certainly, certainly there's this group that exists that require longer steroids than what is advocated by the recovery trial. What we need in the future, what is inescapable, is to uh, expand on this pr preliminary work. I think this is actually a great study that uh, inform, informs us a lot, but uh, inevitably we need to uh, 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 design a future studies probably with a flexible group to answer more precise questions. Uh, also, this study actually provides us a paradigm uh, on how to uh, do a structured post-discharge follow-up. Obviously, in UK, they have a very good system. All right, so uh, this, this is just another article that, uh, uh, which is actually an opinion piece from a Lithuanian group talking about the right time to interfere. They propose about uh, three, uh, at least three weeks after the diagnosis, the UK group used four weeks. So there's been a plethora of publications uh, in so far as OP is concerned. A lot of these cases have been reported. Uh, if memory serves me right, all except for uh, one uh, uh, had, didn't just use radiology for diagnosis and uh, reported remarkable response. I, I, uh, I, 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 I believe that certainly this subset post COVID nineteen uh, will have this persistent inflammatory response that requires longer duration of steroids. So. Uh, uh, to put things in perspective, there was this uh, study in China done in the early early this January to March 2020. This was way before recovery. This was before recovery trial, and there was no steroids used in uh, in uh, in treatment. This was reported in the paper. So most uh, most most OP cases had good prognosis. One third had, had complete uh, absorption lesions at, at one to two months of follow up. So uh, and uh, the the remain, but this is of course up to two months only. Uh, you would think that if there was further follow up, the remaining two third also would have had a near complete resolution. So these patients were not treated with steroids, but still went on to have. Uh, Good, good recovery. So that begs the question I asked earlier whether when, uh, if, if they actually had a placebo group, then we can actually compare and determine whether is it really mandatory to treat with steroids. So uh, precise identification of this group will require uh, some time and require some good uh, collaborative clinical trials, uh, probably multinational uh, uh, and Devon needs to be taken. Uh, I, some, I feel sometimes uh, they do early CT, day, day 9, day 10, and then reported as uh, op like pattern, which is not wrong, but they sub uh, subsequently a lot of these patients uh, tend to improve, but a lot of physicians tend to practice giving long-term steroids. And actually, COVID itself, it is long COVID complications, giving unnecessary steroids really adds to uh, unnecessary complications to these patients. I'm not saying the practice is wrong, but uh, over time, I really hope we can identify uh, the right subgroup of patients and identify a good structured post-discharge follow-up for these patients who really benefit from corticosteroids and who doesn't. 
So uh, there is no proven or preferred, preferred steroid regimen. You really need an RCT setting to determine that. I don't foresee that uh, happening. But in general, if you elect to treat uh, this group of patients, I would uh, suggest employing a lower starting dose than the traditional uh, regimens used for cryptogenic organizing pneumonia, something like what the UK group actually use. And only time will tell whether these are actually a, a persistent inflammatory ILD or truly organizing pneumonia. Regardless, uh, for me, it's actually important whether to know actually whether it's OP or it's just a persistent inflammatory ILD. But uh, semantics aside, regardless, there is definitely this, this we need to appreciate as this group uh, post COVID will actually benefit for, from longer uh, duration of steroid treatment. So from post-COVID-19 OP, uh, I'm moving to post-COVID-19 pulmonary fibrosis. I'm a bit short of time here, so I'll, I'll go a bit faster. So it's inevitable that this pandemic uh, will leave us in trail of uh, a lot of pulmonary fibrosis cases. Uh, the mechanism of post-viral pulmonary fibrosis has been studied previously. TGF beta-1 appears to be the central uh, cytokine in it. This is one of the postulated mechanisms of SARS-CoV-2 induced pulmonary fibrosis. Earlier, I mentioned how SARS-CoV-2 actually leads to increased level of angiotensin II, which tends to be pro-inflammatory, but also pro-fibrotic. Uh, uh, angiotensin II leads to increased level of TGF beta-1 level through its interaction with the AT1 receptor. TGF beta-1 leads to extracellular matrix and myofibroblast activation, and this can lead to a very fibrotic pathway. But what do we know so far? So uh, this study, uh, there have been few papers, so uh, I selected a few to highlight. There's uh, this study by Han, uh, done in China, six months follow-up uh, chest CT findings. Uh, this evidence of fibrotic-like changes was observed in 35%, and remaining showed either complete radiologic uh, resolution or residual interstitial or GGO findings. Uh, the risk factors for those with fibrotic changes, uh, advanced age, ARDS, uh, basically those who had uh, severe illness ventilated for uh, higher sets of ventilation or higher initial CT score. But I need to emphasize that uh, these are not histologically proven uh, fibrosis. <laughs> Uh, these are fibrotic light changes. Some of it can be immature fibrosis, which is fibroblastic foci or immature fibrosis that potentially can reverse or normalize. There's another study from Italy, uh, Caruso's group, also a six-month follow-up chest CT. The post-acute circulate was deleted 72%, as, uh, which is different from the uh, uh, this is because the more, more ill group in this uh, in this population, and they discuss, they, they they identified the baseline lung severity score, showing optimal performance in predicting fibrotic like changes at follow up. But actually, most importantly, as clinicians, uh, instead of knowing what is left at six months, I just uh, for me as a clinician, what I want to know is a uh, few things. I want to know what is actually the clinically relevant residual interstitial lung disease. That is one. You, you may have a bit of scarring. All our TB patients have a bit of scarring, but the large majority doesn't tend to be consequential. So right, the same question, you put the, 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 the residual interstitial lung disease, whether it's actually consequential for the patients. This, that was a radiology paper, so it didn't look into that. Obviously, you need a study that that incorporates, radiolo uh, incorporates symptoms and lung function testing indices together with radiology to answer that question. Uh, also, not only do I want to know what is, uh, what is left, I also want to know what's the trajectory of the disease. Majority of these patients are actually improving over time, then you're, you're, you're much comforted, then you just you don't really need to do anything, but are they getting worse? Those are, that is actually the important question that I want to answer that I want to know. So uh, what the information they actually provide us, they provide us baseline CT findings and six month follow-up that you can see which have, and also the based on the lung segments, the findings, you can see basically there is improvement in every uh, every uh, every aspect except the so-called fibrotic light changes uh, which then which increased a bit. Uh, uh, usually one of the surrogates for fibrosis is traction bronchiectasis. Uh, 
uh, you would expect if really fibrotic changes increase traction bronchiectasis to increase as well, but it did not. So that actually makes it a bit difficult to interpret these fibrotic like changes. And also every other every other finding is improved. Uh, so it makes it a bit difficult to interpret these fibrotic like changes. And these are also fibrotic like changes. These are radiological, it's not histologically proven. Uh, uh, fibrosis. So it still could lessons that we have learned from influenza, SARS-CoV-1, and also most, most of these fibrotic, uh, most of most of these uh, changes tend to improve over time in, over years. We have only we, we've, our our follow-up for these patients post SARS-CoV-2 infection is still immature. But this data is actually very reassuring. Basically, it tells us that a lot of patients are actually going to improve. So uh, in the paper, they provided uh, uh, CT examples. So this shows complete resolution, very good. And also, this uh, the top panel here is the, during the acute infection. And this is at six months. A lot of improvement, actually. But you still get this uh, reticulation, these bands that are fibrotic like changes. But it does not have to mean uh, truly fibrotic because if it, it continues to improve then it becomes uh, uh, I mean reversible fibrosis is an oxymoron because uh, in respiratory we are actually taught fibrosis is uh, permanent and non-reversible so if it's actually uh, uh, it tends to improve I think uh, we should use less uh, punishing uh, terms when uh, uh, when we discuss with patients, uh, I, I personally like residual interstitial lung abnormalities or residual disease uh, until data becomes more mature over time. Also, uh, this uh, abstract that was published in ERS 2020 showed uh, uh, that uh, CTs actually continue to improve and also lung function. There has been a lot of lung function publications post-COVID, but what they have actually reported is that there is persistence of abnormality. However, uh, however, they did not give the trajectory a pathway. This was only study that actually showed even lung function continue to improve. We obviously need uh, studies in... Uh, uh, this important lung function in this is post-COVID to, to correlate with radiological findings over time. So it's essential to appreciate that the pathobiological underpinnings post-viral lung injury actually differs from fibrosing ILDs. Progressive fibrosis is not commonly seen in ARDS secondary to viral infection or other etiologies. Diseases such as IPS and progress or any of the progressive at least a progressive frequent fatal we, we, uh, uh, the, the, the norm for post viral ARDS is not progressive fibrosis. So, this interesting paper by Udwadia actually, although we don't have numbers of data, uh, what we generally think most of these patients con continue to improve, continue to improve with time. So, it's likely they were immature fibrosis. Uh, 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 a few of them tend to be static. Some of them tend to be progressive. This is the group uh, you, that you wonder whether they actually had a silent uh, fibrotic ILD before they actually got COVID. We need uh, time and we need uh, more studies to actually answer the question. But certainly this group, if you can identify them early, uh, whether you want to introduce uh, antifibrotic to this group. So uh, uh, we, we need uh, more and longer longitudinal studies. Serial imaging and lung function testing will best inform us the trajectory. Uh, this is just one of the ways of following up patients that were described by uh, uh, a well-known ILD physician, Professor Ganesh Raghu. But obviously, we have to personalize it to our available resources. So each center needs to uh, decide how best to follow up uh, structured follow-up for these post-COVID patients. So in, uh, in conclusion, a wave of post-COVID-19 lung sequelae has already taken place. Every day, uh, you get referrals for this post-COVID lung sequelae. Uh, until uh, uh, longer long-term data or higher quality data informs us, 
I feel understanding the patterns of uh, lung injury and extrapolating knowledge from previous viral epidemics is currently key to tackle the current situation. Uh, certainly, we await the emergence of uh, more data and experience. With that, I thank you for tuning in. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Um, uh, Kumaresh, for the comprehensive uh, talk on uh, post-COVID-19 lung sequelae, the diagnosis and management. Um, we have, I think, what, just about five minutes left, six, six minutes left. Um, and we've got uh, some uh, interesting uh, questions. Huh? So let, let's try to, if I can combine uh, some of these questions. Um, Number one, um, I think uh, it's, this question is about management of organizing pneumonia, steroid in the management of uh, organizing pneumonia. Um, number one, what what sort of uh, dose uh, do you give in, in, in you know in uh, when you give steroid? Number two, how for how long? What's the duration when you manage uh, when you give steroid? And uh, what would be the I an ideal tapering dose? All right and mm -hmm. And then last question, when do you change from DEXA to prednisolone? So I, I just combined the you know, a few questions together. So um, uh, can, uh, would you like to respond to this? Yeah. The so, dose of steroid, how long, sure. tapering dose, and when you change from DEXA to prednisolone? Sure. Yeah, uh, I think uh, basically the recovery trial used uh, dexamethasone. So there is, uh, that, that, that has become the the standard of care during acute COVID. Of course, there's some evidence during acute COVID, you can use methylprednisolone and all those things. But basically, once the hyperinflammation phase is over, once the CRP ferritins come down, that's when you start thinking of this post-acute uh, COVID phase. And uh, so your task subsequently is actually to determine whether this patient actually has uh, post uh, post-COVID OP or post-COVID inflammatory ILD that will benefit from steroids or not. So what the UK group did is actually upon discharge, they followed up the patient at four weeks. So, and then if there is persistent changes uh, and if it conforms to an OP-like pattern, which they decided during the MDT, they employed the steroid regimen. So they use a 0 0.5 milligram per kilogram which was tapered over three weeks. This, uh, as I said earlier, is different from the OP regimes that we use for cryptogenic OP or autoimmune uh, OP, which uses regimes that last about six to 12 months. So early in the pandemic, I used longer regimens as well, it, uh, largely because uh, we didn't know what we were dealing with then. But over the last months, I've become very confident in giving them shorter uh, steroid regimens and seeing them uh, whenever the clinic appointment allows. So previously, I used to give a tapering regime until they come to clinic appointment, just worry they relapse or all those things. But with a mild study, I'm a bit more confident giving them a shorter regime and uh, seeing them a bit later. But always tell them if symptoms persist or get worse, please uh, come back earlier. Okay, thanks. Uh, Mr. Um no, I think uh, most of you are aware that we do have uh, a CPG on the management of COVID. So, so I think you can refer, I think we all can refer back uh, to the CPG there. Um, one or two more questions on steroid there. So I'll move away from steroid. Uh, one question here. Uh, at what day would you do HRCT when uh, you know, the patient is admitted for COVID and then still uh, oxygen dependent? So when, at what day would you do HRCT then? Uh, that's a very good question. I used to grapple with that as well. So I, I think uh, uh, if they have had a HRCT before and it looks like a diffuse cellular damage pattern, ARDS-like pattern, certainly the, the graph I showed, some of them take months to actually recover. So as long as they continue to recover and the x-rays don't show uh, any suspicion of OP brewing or anything like that, I, I would try not to do a HRCT. If they, have never, if they haven't had a CT before and they continue to improve, because some of them are actually oxygen dependent up to a few weeks. And uh, if, if, they, if you're able to titrate down the oxygen, patient is improving, not getting worse, 
up, I will, I will wait up to four, three to four weeks. If it's persistent at that point of time, then we'll consider HRCT. And given the myel study, if the HRCT conforms to an OP-like pattern, it may not be OP, maybe just persistent in time three ILD, but if it conforms to an OP-like pattern, then I will give a trial of steroids. The other thing that they worry about uh, in COVID is, you know, because COVID is, you know, is a pro-thrombotic uh, conditions. They worry about, you know, pulmonary embolism. So sometimes, you know, um, they, they might consider doing uh, or CTPA uh, to look for evidence for pulmonary embolism that might explain the low hypoxia, I guess. Correct. Yeah, and okay, it's almost almost four o'clock now. Uh, okay, I mean, uh, looking at your slide there, I think it's reassuring that uh, it seems that most of these uh, post-COVID-19 uh, lung fibrosis seem to improve uh, over time, right? And then, you know, uh, um, not many of them uh, develop, uh, you know, um, the, the serious sequelae, you know, the IPF-like uh, fibrosis. I mean, the... It is reassuring then, right? You know, to most patients. Uh, I, I have one question myself, maybe a comment. I mean, I, I saw one paper about, about PBLC in COVID-19. I can't, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I although we interventional pulmonologists would love to do procedures, but we don't want to do <laughs> uh, on COVID-19 patients. Um, uh, and and then and, and uh, having to manage all the potential complications, pneumothorax, you know, bleeding. Uh, uh, can you elaborate a bit? And uh, what what's the purpose of this PBLC in COVID nineteen? Actually, yes, uh, yeah, I I think they were trying to answer what is the histology during the early early COVID phase because. Uh, uh, yeah, I think there was there was by then there was a plethora of publication about what happened to those who died. We were wondering what happened to those earlier. I, I when I saw the paper, I was aghast as well. Uh, I was wondering whether you will be doing it or not. <laughs> uh, I mean, in my practice, we, we we perform PBLC only when you know it is in totally indicated. You know, and uh, you know our I. Uh, Radiology authority, radiology cannot give us, you know, uh, you know, a diagnosis. You know, uh, it's the last resort, you know, for us, you no, know, um, uh, doing PBLC. It's no fun doing PBLC, you know. Uh, you know? <laughs> so you, you really should have a strong indication uh, to do PBLC. Cryobiopsy, you know, I mean, bleeding is a real complication. Pneumothorax, you know. Uh, you don't want to give uh, to raise your blood pressure, you know, uh, you know, having palpitation when doing the procedure is just not worth it, you know. Actually, if you can uh, do, you know, uh, get away from doing TBLC, it is better. Actually, obviously. Um, Doctor Given, I think we have come to the end of the talk. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, we are not. Uh, not able to entertain further questions yeah. and feel free to email um uh, you know dr jivan or dr kumaresh if you have any burning questions yes um so thank you very much um uh, to all of you for listening i think almost 100 participants so uh, it's quite good um so um so over to you dr jivan yeah thanks for the great session by dr jamul and dr kumaresh and thanks for joining us for the with your both um, tight schedule and uh, thanks for all the participants and uh, um, you know things. So next week will be we'll talk all about vaccines. So for now, say goodbye and thanks a lot. See you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.